look at that. Oh. Tell you what, anytime you see this much loot, it's bad news. Hey everyone, this is Shay with 10 Tets Motorsports and we are on to our second day of work on our 350Z drift build. Now, I had a busy morning, so I haven't really spent any time working on this thing, so it only gives us a couple of hours today. But, in that time, I wanna go over a couple of things. One being all of the performance parts we have there in the back and why I felt like it'd be a good choice to have those. And the next one is, I'd like to really get out that rear diff so we can begin looking at it, open it up, see what kind of condition it's in. We pulled all that crud out of it yesterday. Hopefully the bearings aren't too bad, but I'm believing that's gonna be a mess in its own right. Uh, we made a pretty big dent yesterday in all the parts we removed. We removed a lot of the suspension components, we removed a lot of the, basically every, every brake component, except for the uh, parking brake stuff. We removed these ridiculous exhausts, which I, I need to actually still remove that other one so I can run the brake lines for one of our other parts. And uh, I think that's pretty much it. You know, the brake rotors were pretty toast. Pads actually had a little bit of life left in them, but I have no idea what brand they are. But the biggest thing about doing the suspension, the reason why I decided to tear it all apart was because of bushings. Now let me show you this. Okay, this was our passenger side um, control arm, lower control arm I think is what this would be called. Uh, and one, one of our modifications is going to be coilovers, right? We wanna be able to control the suspension and weight transfer of the car. Hopefully that will come into play in, in helping me be a little bit better of a drifter, but we'll see. But the important part about bushings and where they come into play with aftermarket suspension and really any suspension, not just aftermarket, but aftermarket where you have stiffer springs really play a big deal. So check this out. You can probably see, yeah, right there. So that's not good. It's supposed to be completely sealed all the way around. And this bushing, as you can kind of see, is kind of shoved to one direction. Now this of course is because of the weight of the vehicle over time and all of the, the pressure of the shock and the weight of the vehicle being pushed down on this one uh, bushing. So it just kind of happens, especially in New Mexico. We, yeah, it's just terrible on bushings. Anything rubber here will be gone in a matter of years. So uh, luckily GK Tech makes a pretty awesome bushing for not only the chassis side here, but also for the shock. And the reason why is this guy, which is, I mean, that just says it all right there. So this is the driver's side, the side that I think might've been curbed a couple of times. Anyway, the reason why this bushing is worn out is that this type of suspension system, for whatever reason, um, if you modify it and, get, and actually get more angle out of the steering knuckles, you articulate this lower control arm a handful of degrees while you turn at extreme angles. So it just accelerates this wear um, beyond what you would normally do in a car that wasn't modified. But, uh, I mean, something tells me that this probably will happen in a factory application too. So, but on the driver's side, the shock bushing has not completely been destroyed yet, but it's definitely on its way out. So GK Tech is gonna get us taken care of with two really cool bushings that allow for a little bit more articulation and is gonna give us great feedback and response. So that's one big improvement I'm looking forward to. Next one is, I, we have an entire energy suspension bushing kit for this whole car. And I felt it was easier just to order the whole thing and use what we need and not what we don't. Um, however, there's a lot of bushings in that thing, from everything from subframe bushings to control arm bushings. So uh, what I'd like to do is lay them all out and see which ones we need and which ones we don't. It'll give us a perfect time to go over all of our other performance parts we have sitting over there on the shelves. And, uh, and then we gotta talk about wheels because I'm sick of those boxes sitting over there. So wheels, is all, wheels are always a touchy subject among the automotive community. And there's two trains of thought that tend, I mean, and there's two sides to the fence, right? There's the side of, uh, you know, cheap rip off wheels and there's the side of expensive, nice wheels. And that's, that's a conversation it's time us in the motorsports community finally talked about because I think there's a time and place for both, right? And when it comes to drifting, 
you know, especially me trying to drift, right? I'm gonna be drifting side by side, some people, and around some pretty big walls. So it doesn't seem right to have a nice set of wheels that are probably gonna get destroyed. And if I go off a shoulder and into the dirt a little bit, they're probably gonna get chipped up pretty quickly. So uh, rather than spend money on really nice expensive wheels, I decided to opt for a lot of cheap wheels. And I don't mean cheap, cheap wheels, like the cheapest stuff you can find on eBay. I mean things that they've been around in the industry for a while. And in these cases, these are XXRs, which uh, probably came from a facility that makes a bunch of different brands of wheel. Now, the beautiful thing about them is that they're available from a couple of different vendors online, but they're super cheap. And if you buy them, if you buy them during a sale, it's, it's cheaper than what you can possibly buy used factory wheels off Facebook and eBay. So there's just no reason to go around. Picking a set of XXRs that you can get the right offset, a style that you like, color you like, and it uh, you know won't break the bank, you're better off spending that money on tires or another modification. Or really, what you should be spending on is entry fees. So let's get started. We'll start by taking the rear diff out, getting a look at that, starting to look at some of our performance parts, and maybe we'll start mounting some wheels today. This car may have been a Katrina car. Matter of fact, maybe that's what we should start calling it. I dubbed the Katrina the 350Z. All right, now we're pretty much ready to get this uh, rear diff out, and uh, we're gonna have to connect some of these, remove some of these sensors, which go right here. Yeah, I'll just disconnect. I'm not gonna mess with them in there. Don't really wanna mess with that. Oh, you know what? Never mind, I ain't gonna mess with that. 10 millimeter will do. Okay, so never removed one of these before, but I believe the right way, but I believe the right course of action will be to remove this guy first, followed by these two. That way I can catch it and kind of shimmy it out. Hopefully, uh, I don't know what these things weigh. Can't weigh more than, I don't know, 70 pounds, 60 pounds. I don't know why, but I feel like I need to wear my glasses. My, my mechanic senses are tingling. All right, so let's undo, let's undo this one. She a big one, Lords. Okay, so what I'm gonna attempt to do is pick it up, shimmy it out, and hopefully not drop anything on my toes while doing so. connected. Whoops. Alright. Get back up in there.
<sighs> well, I don't really know what else to say, but that was a, it's about pretty much what I deserved. All right. All right. You know, when you have a really bad idea and you know it before you do it, that's pretty much what that rear diff did to me. <sighs> saw my life flash before my eyes. I saw the terrible, angry face my mother was just making at me right then and there. You know, more disappointed than anything. But nonetheless, don't do that by yourself. You know, hopefully most of you guys, if you're doing this at home, you know, use a jack or have a buddy because that wasn't cool. Anyway, moving on. So I want to elaborate a little bit on our wheel choice. Now, I already talked a little bit about the motorsports community, like ongoing argument of wheels are important or like these wheels are going to break immediately and you're going to die or these wheels are the only ones or stay stock kind of argument, which, you know, I, I can get it. Right? No one wants to be driving around on something that's dangerous. Let's say you're driving on the highway and you hit a pothole and the wheel just blows into a bunch of pieces and you cream off into the side of the wall. Worst case scenario, uh, but I've seen really nice wheels. I've seen manufacturers wheels that have broken from hitting potholes, especially potholes in New Mexico, right? But at the same time, I've seen really nice wheels whenever someone who's like at a track day driving pretty enthusiastically hits a corner area a little too gung-ho, and sure enough, as they're driving down the road later, you see the wheel just travel right by them. So, I'm not saying that cheap wheels are as good as nice wheels, especially something that's cast versus drum forged. So, what I am saying is that with the right wheel, I think you can have a good compromise where you can still be safe and save some money. So, my neighbors are doing construction next door, but. I'm going to recommend a wheel that I've personally used for a long time and a wheel that I've raced many different events for, right? Even one that I went off a shoulder at one point in time and I didn't die. So here is one of my favorite cheap wheels of all time. And this is the XXR 527, right? Specifically in black. I like the way it looks. It's pretty straightforward, especially if you get the right offset um, they can look pretty sweet. The concave look is not so prominent on the front wheels, but on the back wheels, you can definitely see it. So, this guy is one of my favorite wheels. Best bang for the buck I think you can get. Strong enough to be raced on, yet cheap enough that you can drift with. So, hence why I got quite a few of them. So, what I was hoping to accomplish was to have one set of 17s for the front and three sets of 17s for the rear. I'd rather spend my time in the seat rather than trying to figure out ways to change tires. So I, instead of buying nicer wheels, I bought extra sets of rears. Now I want to talk about tire choice a little bit. So the fronts, from what, again, my limited knowledge when it comes to drifting, but from what I've gathered, with, <laughs> From what I've gathered by hours and hours of endless YouTube research is that we're going to need a lot of front grip, like most motorsports to be honest. I have a slightly used set of RE71Rs, right? And these are the tires that we use on the BRZ for autocross. Great tire. What I love most about them, a lot of grip at just about any temperature. If you're out having fun in the summer, these tires are going to be just fine. If you're, if you're trying to throw down a sweet lap time in the middle of winter, I don't think any tire is going to be good for you, but this definitely isn't one of them. So, threw these guys on the front, got an extra one down there. All right, now this brings us to the rears. One of the cool things about XXRs is you can get them in interesting widths. So this is a 9.75. And what that allows you to do is kind of manipulate our offset a little bit to get the ideal look you're looking for. Because everyone, regardless of what functionality comes with the car, racing's gotta look good. <laughs> so, anyway, here is the XXRs for the rear. As you can see, that concave look is there that everyone desires. Now, for the rear, <laughs> gathering from my endless YouTube, again, referring to my endless YouTube research, we don't want a whole lot of grip in the rear. We want enough to where it's controllable, but we definitely want 
to have a lack of grip to where we can slide around. So hopefully one of these cheap tires can actually meet our needs and not hurt our pocketbook that much. These tires are so cheap, they have their website along the sidewall. I've never seen that before. So many runs in this bad boy. I kind of want to get rid of these boxes, but it's a little late to be mounting and balance the tires. And I've done a lot of tires today. Not totally interesting. So let's talk about some of this other stuff that I got. Now, let's start with GK Tech. Now, this is something I admittedly know very little when it comes to drifting. But I have watched a lot of videos so far, and it seems like there are three big ways to initiate a drift. One of them is if you're lucky enough to have one of these guys, which is a handbrake, right? Um, well, I guess I should differentiate between, this is an aftermarket handbrake, right? This comes with, this is of course a kit from GK Tech. Oh, my boys down in Australia. I, you know, those Aussies know how to get down from what I'm told. Shout out to my Aussie boys. Anyway, this guy is arguably one of the best looking and most affordable add-on handbrake or second brake kit I was able to find. So, and of course it came from the same company that makes all the other bushings I had my eyes on. So of course we're gonna support the same brand. Anyway, with this guy, will allow us to lock up just the rear wheels and not have to use the parking brake. Because again, you know, parking brake or emergency brake, they're cable driven. In this case, it's cable driven, not always, but in this case, it's cable driven. Eventually they'll stretch. They're not made to handle the same heat as, as an actual brake pad is designed for. So in all in all, I think using your handbrake as a primary method for initiating the drift is, is gonna be short lived. So this was a must in my eyes for this build. The second way of doing it is the clutch kick. Now, I'm not 100% confident, but I believe this vehicle has a dual mass flywheel. And at that point, which pretty much means it's expensive to do a clutch job on this. And from when I was looking at prices, uh, cheap, it's not cheap. So I'd rather not go around clutch kicking this car when this is an option. And the third option is free. I think it's called the Scandinavian flick as well. But basically, you turn into the turn a little early, go to the outside of the turn, and then harshly turn back into the turn, and it, through weight distribution, you're basically transferring weight from the inside to the outside, and then back to the inside as you're turning, which allows the back end to come around. So the combination of the Scandinavian flick and this bad boy will have us drifting in no time. This is kind of an optional mod. However, to me, I felt it was worth getting for one big reason. This is GK Tech's affordable angle kit. And really when I was looking around, you either spend in a nice, <laughs> you're either spending twelve to fifteen hundred dollars, if not some cases more, way more than that, or there's this, which I believe is like two hundred and seventy-five dollars or something like that, because I believe you can build them in different ways. And what really impressed me about this kit is that you didn't have to modify or grind anything. And really, the most important thing about this kit, what really caught my eyes, was the fact that it reduced Ackerman. Now, if you don't know what Ackerman steering is, maybe I'll put a fancy thing here that shows it. But to kind of go off on a little tangent here, if you take your two wheels, right? Everyone knows, well, I shouldn't say everyone. <laughs> it's common knowledge, right? That, well, I shouldn't even call it common knowledge because it's, it's technically a fact, but whatever. Okay, so if you take a pen, you know what, you know what, hold on, hold on, hold on, I'm gonna do this. Man, this drawing would make Bob Ross really proud. Okay. Quick thing. So, this is my drawing of how I'm gonna explain acumen. So, think of it this way. In your car, whenever you take a right turn or a left turn, it's generally a pretty small radius, relatively, right? So, the way the manufacturer designs the front steering of just about most, just about all modern cars, is that there is a small amount of acumen in the steering. What that means is that one wheel will actually have a different angle 
than the other, specifically the inside wheel or the outside wheel, depending on what you're gonna make in a right turn or a left turn. So in this sketch, of course, this is not scientific, so please don't leave, we don't, just leave hateful comments in the bottom. That's great, that's fine. All right, so let's say hypothetically, you're in this car, you're gonna take a right turn. Let, let's say a U-turn at this point. So as you take your right turn, your inside wheel has to travel a shorter distance than your outside wheel. And of course, because of the two different spaces, one on the inside and one on the outside, they are completely different arcs. This arc, let's say, is an 80, your outside arc is an 80 foot radius, right? Which is probably pretty close to realistic. So in order to do that, again, this is not realistic, this is just in my head. Let's say it would be a lot more than that. It'd be like, hold on, let's see, this is probably like a, let's say this is a 30 degree and this is a 20, 27, I don't know, 27. All right, so at this point, your inside wheel, as you turn the wheel to take your right turn, from perpendicular down the center line of your car, this angle here will, let's say, do 30 degrees. Well, your other one will actually do a little bit less than 30 degrees, so that when you take this turn, the front end doesn't seem to bind up. It allows for your wheels to travel the required longer distance or shorter distance and make for a smooth U-turn. Now that's ideal for a commuter car, right? Which takes small left or small right hand turns or U-turns in this case. For drifting, it doesn't seem to help at all. In fact, it's probably very counterproductive. So when drifting, even though your wheels are pointing probably in a very similar angle like this, we're really not traveling that direction, right? We're traveling more of an arc, hopefully like this. And if you're me, it's probably gonna be like, it's probably gonna be like that, but we'll focus on that a little later. So that's acumen, at least as best as I can describe it. So again, for the price, you really can't beat this angle kit. Suspension bushing SBSH, that's probably, that's probably some type of suspension bushing shock, maybe. This is that special bushing I was referring to when we were talking about those lower control arms. Now, as you can see, in fact, I'm gonna draw another arm. So what these guys will allow us to do when we're running that angle kit will give us the small amount of articulation required to achieve that maximum angle we're looking for, but still provide a lot of rigidity. So, fantastic little bushing. And I know I'm starting to sound like I'm swinging from GK Tech, but I promise you, unfortunately, I had to buy all these parts. So these actually were purchased with my own money. And here is one of the coolest aspects to that handbrake kit. So the handbrake kit does not use the pre-existing calipers on the back of the 350Z. In fact, you have to find yourself a second set that will mount to this bracket. Now, this bracket I wanted to bring up because before I knew the thickness of this bracket, I ordered these wheels. And these wheels came in a couple of different offsets that I basically had to just choose my best one. And I figured we'd fix whatever this distance is with a fender roller. So, but very cool that you're able to find an affordable second brake kit for the 350Z. Killing it, guys. Just killing it. Killing it. All right, now this guy right here is an optional product. However, I liked it so much that I just had to get it and it's not too expensive. Now what this guy is, is a second brace for our rear diff. So, may not be necessary. However, again, I wanted to build this car to be as reliable as possible. And if we're gonna be putting a ton of abuse at this thing, I'm not gonna worry about a little bit of extra cash just to give me some peace of mind. So, made here in America. I really like the way it was designed. It looks like it was cut on a water table. The welds look pretty good quality and the finish, uh, this looks powder coated. And on top of that, it's made here in the USA, which I think is pretty awesome. You don't find that very often. And I don't think there's anything better than going out racing and supporting your fellow American. Now again, another optional mod, uh, you definitely don't need this. However, with drifting, it is pretty advantageous to have extended wheel lugs. Reason being, if you wanted to run spacers to get a little more angle out of the front or to stop rubbing, all of that stuff, is possible with extended lugs. Also, another big reason is these guys are designed to go through many, many more cycles than the factory studs were. What that means is that if you're out there taking wheels on and off and, and you're running an impact on these studs, 
these ARP studs will last much, much longer than any factory lug nut will. So, and honestly, I happen to be a fan of the open-ended wheel lug. So, got these bad boys and a nice set of lug nuts to go with them. Oh my gosh, okay. And any chance I get, I like to support local companies. And WaveSpec is a company that before I've even done this video, they've supported me locally during racing. I've used their brake rotors, like I said, for a couple of years, and that's no joke. I'm not lying at all. Fantastic product. I really believe in what they're doing. And look how cool these things look, right? So a quality rotor made by an American company that has a one-off look, I can't ask for anything more, right? And to go along with it, we got ourselves one of my favorite brake pad companies, Hawk, right? Now, this is an interesting thing because brake pads and brake rotors, as you heard from our conversation, should be sized and set appropriately. Now, the rear brakes in this car presented us with a really interesting, unique opportunity. So, what I mean by that, these are actually the rear brake pads that we have. Let me just set this bad boy down real quick. Yeah. So, as you can see, I have a set of HP Plus and a set of HPS brake pads, both designed for the rear of this car. Now, mixing brake pads has been done in the motorsports community for a long time. If you want to control the brake bias or tweak the car a little bit, as far as its trail braking characteristics, a lot of times people will put a more aggressive pad in the rear than in the front. Now, what makes this project a little differently is that they will both be on the same rotor. Now, there are two major schools of thought on brake pads, right? There are film-based ones and there are ones that actually remove material from the rotor. These two brake pads, after speaking with Hawk Performance himself, they're very similar, right? However, what's great about the HP Pluses is they have significantly more bite at colder temperatures than the HP Plus. So when I hit the brake pedal, I want the car to be balanced. On the calipers that use the rear brake pedal, we're gonna stick with HPS all the way around. But on the handbrake, I believe I want it to bite as hard and as quick as possible. So we're gonna be using a set of HP Pluses. Now, beautiful thing, from what I've been told, is that there shouldn't be a large problem with these two films interfering with the other during normal braking. So, kind of a cool bit for science, you know? All right, this guy, depending on what part of the world you reside in, goes by two different names. Here in the land of freedom, these are called sway bars. However, in other parts of the world, they're often called anti-roll bars. And learn to spell tire right. Anyway, regardless of what you believe this is called, it does the exact same thing. Now, what I love about sway bars is that when you're actually turning, right, when weight is being transferred from the inside to outside is when this guy really comes into play and it shines. Most sway bars will not increase your spring rate when you go over a straight line bump, like a speed bump. Well, as long as you go over it straight. If you're going over it crooked, then yeah, it's gonna change a lot. But what is beautiful is this increases spring rate exponentially compared to springs themselves and really only while weight is being transferred from an inside to the outside. Another common thing that people kind of forget about adjustable sway bars. This guy's got three holes on this side and three holes on that side. You don't have to use the same hole on either side. If you wanted to use the stiffest setting on one and the softest on the other, you can do that. And that will give you a different setting than if you used both middles. So with this bad boy, I'm really confident that even I can trip. Right, and now on to one of my favorite topics, the coil over. Now this guy is for the rear, so this car does not have a, well, what is referred to a coil over. This is just our damper. In the back, we got individual springs. In the front, we have a more traditional coil over setup. Now the reason why I chose the Tane Flex Zs is they're probably the best priced coil over on the market for many applications. Because these things are more affordable, they're only single adjustable. But these do adjust both compression and rebound with each click. So you're not just on one spectrum of the shock at one point in time. On top of that, Tane's got a great name and they are rebuildable. When it comes to suspension, I'm a big advocate for spending money on quality parts. Reason being is generally when you're done with them, if it's a quality part, they're still perfectly viable for resale. And a lot of people can get the majority of their money back out. Something like this is great if you're just getting into the adjustable suspension market. Too many knobs can often get people in trouble. Been there. All right, now, nothing really too excited about these, but we're upgrading the rest of the brake system. Might as well upgrade the lines. Now, 
I don't anticipate drifting to really create a whole lot of heat in the brake system, but nonetheless, these brake lines are probably pretty old and we're gonna be dealing with more angle than we've ever had before. So it's probably a good safe bet just to replace these guys. Again, these are not required mods, but I would definitely put these on the highly suggested side of things. All right, on to the fun part of our modifications. Now, heat management is always something you need to consider in any motorsport. Oftentimes, driving around in Phoenix, it's just a problem of having to sit in traffic too. So having a way to manage all of that excess heat from these racing conditions is a must thing to think about. When it comes to cooling, there's definitely not a better name than Mishimoto, right? They've been around the market for a long time. They've supported many different types of racing. So when it comes to any type of radiator or oil cooler, these are the guys to go to. Now, an oil cooler is likely critical in just about any motorsport you're gonna participate in. Now, in drifting, I think it's gonna be relatively critical because we're gonna have moments of very high sustained RPMs and then parts of just hard parking it and letting the thing cook. So, regardless, I want this motor to last as long as possible. Again, think of it as an investment. So, Mishimoto makes a fantastic engine oil cooler kit and they make it in two different kinds, a thermostatic and a non-thermostatic. This guy being the thermostatic. Hey, we have, the we have the money for that? So it consists of a couple things. The heat exchanger, and this pretty fancy sandwich plate. Look at this thing, pretty cool. All right, so this guy will be attached to our existing oil filter housing where two lines will then run an in and an out to our heat exchanger, coming back into this guy and into the engine. And this guy right here, you can see, if you can get this or not. Yeah, there you go. This guy is what makes time travel possible. No, so this is what makes it thermostatic or not. If you live in the part of the country where it does get cold, specifically cold and hot in the same day like it does here, mid-spring, the it's ideal. You don't, you don't want your oil to be cooled excessively. You want it to be at the optimum temperature, not too cold, not too hot. If your car is gonna purely be a race car in the heat of summer, then maybe this is not necessary. However, I decided since we're probably gonna be taking this car to some of the other events and car shows, might as well toss a little extra in and get the thermostatic one. Man, this is nice. This is nice. Oh, okay. What have we got here? All right, look at that. That's real fancy. All right, so um, this car did not come with a factory intake. Uh, it had that fancy aftermarket one, how long was zip ties? Now, I'm a big fan of zip ties, but I think there's a way of doing it right, and I don't think that was it. So, since we were already buying products from Mishimoto, decided to get not only their intake hose, but also a hose kit for the radiator, coolant lines, and whatnot. So, this guy will add a much needed bling and a little more order to our engine bay. What have we got here? Awesome, okay, so again, more radiator hoses, Looks like it's got some overflow hoses as well. This should bring together the overall look of the engine bay and make it look pretty special. So, now, this is not, now I should say this is not all about making it look really nice. A lot of these hoses are probably the original hoses in this car and this thing's got like, in fact, I don't even know how many miles it has on it. I'm pretty sure it's got way more than what the odometer says. Cause we went to register it. it oh, they said it had like 300 and some thousand registered miles on it, who knows, anyway, so. <laughs> Again, when we talked about this build, we were talking about making this vehicle as reliable as possible and to get the most seat time possible. Now, if you're out there in the 115 degree weather and you're out there throwing a sick drift around the corner and all of a sudden coolant sprays everywhere, you just went from hero to zero and your day has pretty much been ruined and you forfeited your entry fees. So, taking a little bit of your budget and investing in some insurance will go a long way. Oh my God! <sighs> Look at this junk. Okay, here is that energy suspension bushing kit I was talking about. Installation instructions. Hey, the rear diff bushings, sweet. So, open this guy up. Oh, that's nice. Oh, look at that. That's gonna be fun to install. Can't wait to try and do that. So, this is pretty sweet. Anyway, so these guys are the rear diff for the guys sitting on the bottom there. Now, 
Um, these, of course, are an optional, an optional mod. You don't need these to go drifting on a 350Z. However, the diff bushing, at least the major one, this big guy, is probably well worth your investment because I don't know if I got a good photo of it. I'm pretty sure we got a good photo of it. Yeah, we got a good photo of it. That thing is just ready to fall out, right? So in fact, it's probably gonna be harder to put this one in than to get that one out. So when it comes to racing a car, I think there are two really important things. And one of them is feedback. And what these guys will give you is significantly more feedback between the road, the wheel, brakes, and the seat. So hopefully these achieve that goal. Oh, look at that. Oh. Tell you what, anytime you see this much lube, it's bad news. Oh. That little stroller thing there is probably the most uncomfortable thing you can sit in. So back to our previous conversation. The second important thing I think when you're racing any vehicle from a driver's perspective are ergonomics, right? There's a handful of chassis that I absolutely hate only because I can barely fit in them. Now, I'm not the tallest person in the world, but a lot of these cars are imports, which means they were designed by Japanese people. And I'm not saying that as an insult, but if you've ever been to Japan, you realize a lot of things, but one of them, the streets there are very, very tiny. So cars are very, very tiny. And because these cars are very tiny, these seats tend to be very tiny. The 350Z is not one of those problems. However, this guy, oh yeah, this is gonna work real well. Being stabilized in the car, so you can actually pay attention to what's coming up and respond to whatever the needs or corrections of the vehicle are, this guy is gonna be it. A 200,000 mile factory seat is not gonna give you the control that you need. Who's paying for all this? All right, last but not least, brake rebuilding kits. More specifically, caliper rebuilding kits. Now, again, this car has 200 plus thousand miles on it. In fact, could we find out how many miles are on this car? I have no idea. A lot of miles on this car. And there's nothing worse than taking a vehicle to a sporting event, going around a turn, and realizing you don't have any brakes. So, I have to urge you, whatever vehicle you buy to do any type of motorsports, go through a checklist, a basic checklist. Make sure there's brake fluid in it. Make sure it's not leaking. Make sure that when you press on the brake, it's actually stiff. So what we're gonna be doing, just to make sure, it gives us a little insurance, we're gonna be rebuilding all of our calipers. So, which is perfect timing, because this is exactly what we're gonna do. Those calipers over there, we're gonna take them apart. And again, because we want this thing to look nice, I wanna show up and it to be a little blinged out. People are gonna be like, man, that guy actually might know how to drift. So when I go around turn one and I bin it in the dirt, at least I'll look pretty good doing it.